It's tradition here at CBS News to gather our Washington reporters and look forward to the year ahead. We begin with our beat reporters here in the nation's capital. David Martin is CBS News national security correspondent. Jen Crawford is our chief legal correspondent. Robert Costa is our chief election and campaign correspondent. Catherine Herridge, senior investigative correspondent. And Jeff Pegues is our chief national affairs and justice correspondent. So thank you all for celebrating with us <laughs> and being here at the table. Jan, I want to start with you because we are heading into a year where the Supreme Court is going to play such a central role to our politics. We saw just this past week the Colorado Supreme Court rule that the former president, Donald Trump, could be disqualified from holding office because he engaged in insurrection leading up to January 6. How firm of a legal legal ground is this on here? Well, I mean, yes. I mean, the court is going to be front and center in the presidential campaign, and that's just one of a number of issues that these justices are going to have to confront in the upcoming year. This one uh, asks whether or not he's even qualified uh, for being a, a, a president, I mean, for running for president, uh, because of a clause in the 14th Amendment. Now, the Colorado Supreme Court was sharply divided on this, four to three, and that's a decision it reached uh, saying he wasn't qualified under this provision that other state Supreme Courts have seen differently. There are a lot of problems uh, with the arguments uh, that they adopted, uh, that they kind of just blow right by. And the Supreme Court, I don't think, is uh, going to kind of give it that kind of gloss. I mean, some of the questions that uh, I think the court will look very closely at if uh, they take this up, and I think they have to take this case up, is how Trump uh, can be considered an insurrectionist if he was not charged or convicted of insurrection and whether or not uh, the 14th Amendment and, and this section specifically would even apply to him uh, at all as, as someone who's a former president or running for president. But apart from this particular case, there are others the Supreme Court may take up in relation to the former president and current front runner for the Republican nomination. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like whack-a-mole, right? <laughs> you know, like you've got one over here and you're going to try to, you know, he's going to try to put this one up and knock it down. Another major issue, legal issue brewing, is whether he can be prosecuted criminally for some of the actions around January 6th. Now, a federal uh, district court judge here in D.C. said that he was not absolutely immune from prosecution uh, as a former president. The special counsel, who has, of course, charged uh, the former president uh, with the actions around January 6th, has asked the Supreme Court, and, and of course, we'll see uh, how they handle this, has asked the Supreme Court to jump over an appeals court and, and decide whether or not the former president of the United States is immune from criminal prosecution for actions he took in office. This is a, a big request to come from the special counsel. It's unusual to try to bring it all the way to the court this quickly, right? And this will have major implications, obviously, <laughs> Bob Costa, on the campaign you are covering. But tell me what you're hearing about what the special counsel is thinking in going through these steps. As I look ahead as a reporter, the campaign is going to come back again and again, likely to the high court, and how it's going to consider Trump's conduct in and around January 6th, whether it's the immunity question, whether it's about the January 6th defendants who have their cases coming before the Supreme Court, whether it's about how the court's going to proceed if Trump's convicted in the special counsel case. All this comes down to what was an insurrection? What's an insurrectionist type act? What was the president's role? What did he not do? Did he conspire against the United States? Based on our reporting at CBS News, the special counsel has phone records. He has memos and diary entries from key witnesses like former Vice President Mike Pence, key eyewitness testimony from people who are inside the Oval Office with Trump. And we got a bit of a taste of this with the January 6th committee in recent years, but they had something in the special counsel's office the January 6th committee never had, which is subpoena power to really go deep with witnesses and not just get public testimony in some depositions. They've gone deep. And I've talked to people who've participated in this investigation as lawyers, sometimes even as witnesses. And it's evident to me, based on my conversations with sources, that Jack Smith has a sprawling case mm -hmm. against former President Donald Trump. Catherine and Jeff, I know you talk to a lot of law enforcement sources as well. What's the degree of concern about what happens how, as this plays out in the coming year? 
already law enforcement across the country is dealing with an uptick in domestic terrorism cases because there is this concern about how will the public react if there is a conviction in any of these cases and already uh, the number of domestic terrorism cases that they've been investigating at the FBI specifically uh, compared to the number of international terrorism or organizations and those kinds of cases they're about running even so law enforcement is is also very focused on preventing any kind of domestic terrorism. We're in this incredibly dynamic threat environment right now. And the focus squarely is on lone actors or lone offenders, individuals who are inspired by events overseas, or they're inspired to act radicalized by domestic events and very opportunistic. So it talks about car ramming attacks, it talks about weapons, it talks about knives and a very short, what law enforcement calls flash to bang, that period in between <coughs> wanting to act and then making the decision to act. And uh, David Martin, this, here's where I wanna turn to you because uh, we already have all this sort of kindling out here. And then you have a huge event like we saw with October 7th, the attack in Israel and the subsequent very brutal war that <laughs> continues to play out that the United States is really trying to bring to a conclusion. How far out are we because that is raising concerns about U.S. national security at home? Well, the Israelis have told the U.S. they think they can wrap up the current phase, which is this general offensive against Hamas in, in Gaza, in early January. But then they say this war is going to go on for months. Hamas has been uh, compared to ISIS, so it's worth remembering that our war with ISIS started during the Obama administration. We overran the last ISIS stronghold in the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. And here we are in the Biden administration and special operations forces are still conducting the occasional raid into eastern Syria to go after an ISIS leader. Now, Gaza is a lot more restricted uh, than eastern Syria. It's just but 25 miles. And that hopefully will keep this from being a years long battle. Mm -hmm. But terrorist organizations die hard. That's mm -hmm. just the fact. And you've had the defense secretary basically say this could create more radicalization because of what's mm -hmm. happening there, but also the impressions and what the world is watching in terms of this use of American force. Win the battle, but lose the war. Exactly. Uh, eliminate Hamas but become less secure um, because of your tactics, which are losing you international support and creating a whole new generation of young people that uh, want nothing but to see the destruction of Israel. That's, that's the, uh, the deadly game that Israel is playing here, but they, they sure don't show any signs of backing off their original intention to mm -hmm eliminate Hamas. No, and that's spilling out publicly now in these differences between Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Biden um, in the vision for what happens next and, and how this plays out. Um, but in the Middle East as well, David, the administration likes to say, while they may not be able to persuade the Israeli prime minister to do what they want, they think they've largely contained this from becoming the worst case scenario they imagined of a wider regional war. But there's still a lot of dangerous activity happening. Well, you've had over 100 ta attacks by Iranian-backed militias against uh, American troop locations in Iraq and Syria. The Houthis, who most people had never heard of before the start of this war, these, these rebels in, um, in Yemen, who are also backed by Iran, have come in on the side of Hamas and have fired more than 100 missiles and drones, either at Israel or at any ship passing by that they think may be coming either to or from Israel. Um, and the U.S. is trying very hard not to let either of those situations get out of hand. After 100 attacks on American troops, you have to retaliate some. You can't let the other guys just get free shots. And they have taken some retaliatory strikes, but they're very mm -hmm. limited. And I think that will stay the same unless and until 
one of these mortars, one of these rockets, one of these drones gets through and kills or seriously injures Americans. And then the whole calculus changes. Catherine, you have this extraordinary job of covering the president's own son and his legal issues. Um, Hunter Biden, with these indictments, three related to a firearm, felony right. counts, mm -hmm. nine related to tax issues. Where does this go? 2024 is going to be a year of incredible legal exposure for the president's son. And these criminal prosecutions are going to unfold at the same time that his father is running for re-election. Uh, in January, he will be arraigned in a California court on the tax charges. And I would pay special attention to the California case. I had two lawyers look at the 56-page indictment, and they reached the same conclusion, that it is a shot across the bow by the special counsel. He identifies Hunter Biden as a lawyer, a consultant, and a lobbyist, and then goes into considerable detail about his business transactions with Ukraine, uh, with China, Romania, and others. And they see this as an indicator that the special counsel, at the very least, is investigating potential violations of foreign lobbying laws, mm -hmm. maybe even a superseding indictment. Donald Trump spends a lot of time talking about the president's son and these legal issues. As this plays out in a courtroom, you know, how important are the facts to voters and how important is the perception and, and how do you make sense of this? Until Democrats believe there is evidence presented, if ever, that ties President Biden directly to his son's business endeavors in terms of being a lobbyist or being someone who is influencing policy, coordinated with his son, they are going to continue from the rank and file to the leadership be behind President Biden. And you haven't seen any Democrat of note come out about President Biden's connection with his son as anything more than familial and something that presents a problem. Jen, a just bigger picture, you've watched the Supreme Court for so long, a court that Donald Trump says he takes credit for shaping the, in terms of its conservative direction. Is there still faith in it? and how it functions um, now that they are directly inserted right into our politics. Well, yeah, I mean, President Trump's nominees three certainly changed the court in a much more conservative direction, and we've seen that very clearly. I mean, this is a Supreme Court uh, that overturned Roe versus Wade. I mean, that, that and we've seen the political fallout from that. For years uh, now. Yeah, and, and so I think, uh, what's gonna be really interesting for the court right now is that they're getting these cases, as, as Bob laid out too, that they involve the president on any number of levels. Uh, and it's a real opportunity for the Supreme Court and, and in particular the Chief Justice to show that they are above politics. Mm -hmm. The court has had all of these contentious issues at abortion, affirmative action. They've taken a hit in polling. Uh, some of their the, the kind of the faith and confidence in the court right now, according to polls, is at among its lowest point ever, still higher than the other two branches. Um, and the media, by the way. And I think that that is what you're going to see. I think Trump's going to win some and he's going to lose some. David, one of the institutions that still has some faith in it is the military, when, it, when you look at public polling. Um, the year we are about to start feels very consequential on the national security front, not only because of the Middle East, because of the war that is playing out in Europe at a decisive point as we debate this Ukraine aid package. You look at Asia, the rising China, this upcoming January election in Taiwan that will be consequential as well. What's happening inside the Pentagon right now as they gear up for 2024? Well, they're going in all, all sorts of different directions, but <clears throat> there's sort of two Pentagons. There's the one Pentagon that uh, develops systems and plans for future wars. They're now focused on China. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that is just a totally different ballgame than Ukraine uh, or what's what's going on in the Middle East. And then when they still have to worry about about terrorist organizations. So uh, they're, they're going in all these different directions. But look, <clears throat> during the Biden administration, we've had the withdrawal from Afghanistan. We've had the start of the war in Ukraine and we've had the start of the war between Israel and Hamas. They're kind of on. <laughs> on emergency standby yeah. all day, every day, as, exactly. it, as it is. You know, I was reading China's top military official warned China will show no mercy to anyone who supports uh, independent Taiwan. Is the American military and the Chinese military in contact yet so that this doesn't escalate? 
Well, they're trying. They're what they're called is talks at the working level to <laughs> do the uh, the high level contacts. But with everything having to do with China, it's complicated. But even if they get these contacts going, I mean, China's behavior is not going to change overnight. They're still going to harass uh, American surveillance planes in the South China Sea. They're still going to keep building up these disputed islands in the South China Sea. It's just another mechanism for managing a very difficult relationship. Mm -hmm. And at least in 2023, they started talking I, at the diplomatic level. 